color, whatever tools you use. We try to make them exactly like we want them to appear, not sketches, okay, uh, after we have the data. And we actually lay them out on a table or the floor, lay them out to tell a story. How are you going to tell the story so that your reader can understand? So we generate, just like in the movies, a storyboard. Okay? And we go change things around. And we, they're not necessarily in the chronological order that we collected the data, okay? but rather of the way to tell the story. So we create the storyboard. And as we generate each display item, and here I say figures, we write the captions for those figures. Even if, you know, you get the figure, you write the caption right then. You don't wait, at, don't do it as an afterthought, okay? Now, like I said, we try to get it exactly the way we might want it, with all the symbols readable and everything. And why are we doing that, okay? Well, as you get the data, make the figure, write the caption, you may see what is missing. If there's something missing or something you'd like to add. As you do that, it stimulates ideas on maybe how to improve that data set, you know, that small data set for that one display item. So the writing process stimulates ideas, more ideas. And, you know, we have a manuscript currently that we're writing, and every day we think, oh, yeah, new idea coming in. Okay. So <coughs> The caption, so here's the deal. I'm a, you know, if I'm reading an EPR paper, uh, think about how you read a paper. When I'm reading a paper on EPR from the uh, Ohio State group, you know, I read the title, I look at the abstract to get the gist of things, and then I often go right to the figures, and I just look at the figures, the display items. And I'm a technical expert in EPR. I should be able to know what the story is without reading the words. I look at the figure, I look at the captions, tables, whatever it might be, and I have the essence of the story. So that's the way you want to set it up. Okay, think about it. The technical expert can just see the story. And then, obviously, details or figure captions elsewhere. Okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> titles. So, the paper has a title, figure captions have a title, tables have a title. Everything has some title to it. And uh, I came across this a few years ago. A journal wrote back saying, well, we're going to accept your paper, but we want informative titles rather than descriptive. Well, I never heard that distinction at that time. This was about 15 years ago or so. And I said, oh. And they gave examples. And I said, oh, this makes so much sense. So a descriptive title is something like the effect of A on B, where an informal title informative title is A kills B. That is, an informative title is giving you the conclusion as appropriate, and it usually has a verb in it. So you have a figure, and you have a descriptive title, the effect of A on B. You're leaving it to the reader to look at the data and make a conclusion. You know, they're looking at, well, what's, what's the conclusion from this figure or this table of data? Okay? And you're not there to help them. But with an informative title, A kills B, oh, that's what the uh, writers, that's what the group thinks is the conclusion. And now it's very different. Rather than uh, uh, having help, or, or you know, the, the reader looking to see what is the conclusion from this data, they're saying, oh, do I agree with that? Very different, very different. Do I agree with that? Rather than, well, what is the conclusion? So here's a, a, table, a, a graph you saw on Monday evening, and very simple. And this, so these things apply to your PowerPoint, too. Okay, same thing, a title at the top that's informative. Manganese SOD inhibits tumor growth, the nice verb. That's the conclusion. Now you look at the data and you see, do I agree with that? Okay. Tables, they're the same as figure. Make them easy to understand. Now, I normally would not take two, two sets, two pieces of data and make a table out of it but this is for pedagogical purposes. At the top of the table is always a title. Most people waste it. They don't put anything there to speak of, okay? They waste this opportunity. I have here UV light increases iron in skin, okay? Then here's, here are the data, skin sample, you know, uh, on the left is, you know, what's going on, and on the right are the data. Very simple. Now, the other thing is, is to make sure this is all understood. And 
this is where table footnotes come into view. So I have table footnotes, a couple examples here, it's where you explain things about the data that are in that table. Okay? And it makes it very easy for it just to look at it and get the whole the story out of it. Okay? So get it on paper. I, in our lab, uh, start a title page immediately because it makes it look official. Even though uh, this modern era, we're uploading our manuscripts, okay, I still have the title page. Okay, make up. And so you see I have something highlighted in yellow. That's something we have to tend to yet. Uh, you know, well, this isn't finished. And so we have it looking official with the, I actually have a title. But sometimes we'll have two or three titles. We haven't decided which one. Okay, so this is just a working document. So we have a title, but it's not the final title, perhaps. We're going to talk about that. I worked in a lab in Germany uh, a long time ago in submitting a manuscript. And we're all <coughs> excuse me, uh, around the table looking at it and, and you know doing the final edits. And at the very end, at the very end, before we sort of close the session, I said, is this the correct title? Is this the best title? And at the very end, we changed the title because it fit better. So <coughs> the title. How do I make a title uh, for a paper? Well, I list all the key primary words, and I try to construct an informative title that contains these key words, or at least the most important of them. And the title will most likely have a verb in it. And if appropriate, the title should state the main conclusion of the paper, if appropriate. And I use mainstream words, words that you know, are common and official, shall we say, as appropriate to our area of science. Then I let it age, constantly rethink as the paper, or the manuscript, I should say, uh, is being worked on. So again, informative rather than descriptive. So here's the paper titles. Production of lipid-derived free radicals in L1210 urine leukemia cells is an early event in PDT. Okay. Uh, PHPPX protects against singlet oxygen-induced damage. Phospholipid hyperperoxide, uh, induces a delay in G1 of the cell cycle. So these get the main conclusion of the paper. Now the bottom one, EBR, EPR detection of free radicals in UV irradiated skin, mouse versus human. There's no real conclusion because, uh, but <coughs> the conclusion is uh, in, in favor that, well, yeah, mouse is a good model for, uh, for human skin. And, but you can see from the title that what you're going to see in that paper. Abstract. Okay. So uh, people have all different opinions on when to write an abstract. Uh, we write it about any time. But again, at the very end, we go back over it word for word and make sure it fits what we finally wrote in the paper. That's going to be changing. And in the abstract, we will include those secondary keywords, the ones that didn't make it in the title. Okay. Make sure they get there. So that way the searches uh, uh, literature searches can pop your paper up to interested, potential interested readers. I try to pack it with concrete information because this title and abstract is your billboard to the world. Okay, so you do a search. Okay, you get 500 papers uh, in your search of Medline or whatever database you have to be using. And uh, now you're not going to read all 500 immediately, right? You're going to sort through and pick out ones. Well, how do you pick them out? Well, you're going to look title and see if that title conveys something that's, uh, that's going to be, say, as close to what the information you're looking for, right? And then, oh, well, this looks interesting. And then you look at the abstract. And if the abstract is fuzzy, poorly written, you'll say, oh, no, nah, let's go on and check out the next one. <laughs> okay. So think about how do you get information, get your readers to actually read it, your potential readers. So we put a lot of concrete information to draw the reader in. And as appropriate, we have an introduction, we clearly state the hypothesis, the problem being addressed, facts, and some conclusion at the end. Sometimes when I'm in a hurry reading an abstract, I simply read the first one or two sentences to get the you know, hypothesis or problem, and I jump to the last sentence and read the conclusion. I do that same thing with the, with the posters out here. You know, I try to get, what's the hypothesis? Students yesterday, I what was your hypothesis? And I read the conclusions. And then I have context for what's in between. So here's an example. I hope I can see it. Okay. Uh, kind of hard for you, perhaps, here. Ultra 
ultraviolet radiation produces free radicals in mouse skin, uh, contributing to photoagenic carcinogens. So that's an introductory sentence, what this paper is kind of about. If a mouse model is a uh, general indicator of free radical processes in human skin, then 